How's everybody? Great to see y'all out in the house of God today. Before we get ready to uh, get into the word, I want to, uh, first of all, welcome everybody that's tuned in online. So glad to have you all today. Y'all know we got people watching from all over the place. Amen. And uh, so our church is uh, expanding beyond just the four physical walls. Amen. I've, I ran into uh, I ran into somebody yesterday, uh, no, Friday, ran into somebody, no, Thursday, ran into somebody Thursday. And uh, they didn't say they attend our church. They didn't even say they had ever been to our church. They just said, I watch you online every week. I said, man, this is the day and age we live in today. So you got a whole lot of church family out there. We just want to say hi. We're so glad that you have tuned in with us today. Uh, for those of you all that are here in the sanctuary and for those of you that are watching online, uh, you know, we've been praying for, uh, you know, been praying for breakout and praying for God to, you know, uh, send people that are not saved and for people to get saved and get filled with the Holy Spirit and all those great things. And so we are, uh, we're talking about uh, potentially starting a fourth service. Amen. Uh, and so uh, we, uh, this is what I'm, I need you all to do me a huge favor. Uh, so we don't know if we're going to, and we're looking at a few options. We're looking at maybe doing a fourth service. We're uh, looking at maybe some other locations, possibly look at doing another location somewhere in the city. Uh, and so we need your help, though. We really want to hear from you guys uh, concerning this. And so on the screen, um, there is a QR code. I need everybody to take a moment to fill out the survey. It's just two questions. That's it, just two questions. So take a picture of the QR code. Uh, we want to know uh, what your thoughts are about a Friday service, Friday night service, or a Saturday uh, service sometime in the evening. Uh, and so that information is on the survey. So please take a moment and just fill that out. We're just kind of gathering data right now to kind of figure out what we're going to do in the future. Uh, you know, 97% of churches in America are, are 300 people or less. Uh, so that means that we're in the 3%. I mean, we're not in that 300 people or, or less. Uh, we, our church is probably about 1,500 people or so that, that are members here at Faith Christian Center. And, and uh, we're not trying to be popular. We're just trying to fulfill our assignment. And, um, you know, most studies will tell you once your church gets to about 70, 80 percent capacity, you need to look at starting a new church. And we've been way beyond that for a very long period of time. And so we just want to make some more space uh, for other people here in the city that we believe can be impacted uh, by our church. And my prayer, uh, my prayer for our church is that God will push us out of the upper room. Because, I mean, you know, if the church doesn't leave the upper room to go out into the streets, then they don't go into Jerusalem, they don't go into Judea, and they don't go into the uttermost parts of the earth. And I may all remember when the church decided that they weren't going to go, that's how Saul of Tarsus rose up and began to persecute the church. Uh, the same thing happened in Genesis chapter 11 after the flood. Uh, God had told them to replenish the entire earth, and they decided the Tower of Babel, listen, we're of one language and of one speech. Instead of spreading to the uttermost parts of the earth, let's build a tower just in case another flood comes, and let's just stay right here. And God confounded the language because whether we want to or not, man is going to fulfill what God put us here on this earth to do. Amen. And you know what I don't want to happen, Faith Christian Center? I don't want God to say, you know, I'm, I'm doing something special in this church, uh, but then they told me no. So I skipped past them and I went to another church that would say yes to what I wanted to do to impact more people's lives. And I just think about my pastor, Bishop Butler. Uh, Bishop Butler used to say, and you heard from him a few weeks ago, uh, he asked God why he picked him. And the Lord told Bishop that he said, you were my fifth choice. He said, everybody else told me no. I don't want to be that church. I want to be the church that says yes. Can anybody else in, in agreement with that, that we saying yes? And uh, so whatever we decide to do, you know, we're going to need volunteers. We're going to need more help, you know, more hands make for light work. And so uh, we, 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 I trust that the Lord is speaking to you. And if he isn't, I pray that he wakes you up in the middle of the night. I pray he speaks to you in your dreams. I, I pray the Holy Spirit gets all over you that it'll be like fire shut up in your bones. You won't be able to contain it or resist it until you say, yes, Lord, your servant hears. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, I trust you came ready for some word today. 
Y'all funny at 10 o'clock. Y'all don't like me to talk too long. You'll be like, Pastor, come on. Get on. Let's, let's, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. It's hilarious. All right, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we honor you, we bless you, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come boldly to your throne that we may obtain mercy, find grace to help in time of need. And God, as we come today, we come in faith, we come trusting and believing that both your grace and your mercy has been made available for us. We thank you so much for the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of grace, Spirit of love, Spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Holy Spirit, we lean on you today to, to lead us and guide us into the whole, the full, and the complete truth. May our hearts burn on the inside as you open up the scriptures concerning yourself. As we sit down at your table, today on my desires to prophesy to interpret your divine will and purpose and inspire preaching and teaching I pray that you will use me to get in everybody's kool-aid today and stir it up a little bit I pray God I'll be like a fly on the wall I'll speak with specifics and details that transcend my human comprehension but speak specifically into the hearts and the lives of those that are here and those that are watching my prayer is that there's not one hard heart tuned in today that everybody's willing to make accommodations for the good seed of the word so that it can grow and produce 30 60 and 100 times as much in Jesus name and everybody in agreement today said amen, amen. you can be seated we're going to start today in Matthew chapter 24 before we read our text uh, just to give you some context um, the disciples had asked Jesus a question they said uh, what will be the signs of your coming and also of the end of the age? And Jesus, for the entire chapter, and then also really going into Matthew chapter 25 as well, begins to go into detail about some of the signposts that you and I can begin to look for to know that we are closer to the Lord's return and that we are closer to this whole thing wrapping up. I mean, you know, we are living in the last days. If you don't know, if you don't know that, you need to wake up because we're in the last days. Amen. And a lot of the events, even that we see unfolding uh, today, uh, you know, even with what's happening with Israel right now, I really feel like we have really turned a corner uh, because whether you want to acknowledge uh, Israel or not, like Israel or not, really doesn't matter. At the end of the day, um, the capital of the United States of America is Washington, D.C., but the capital of the world is Jerusalem. Uh, Jesus is not coming back and setting up his throne in North Dakota. When he comes back, his throne is going to be set up in Jerusalem. That's where he's going. Uh, and so uh, it is very important. Uh, you understand that most of the Bible uh, evolves around what's happening in that nation. That's God's covenant that he has uh, with his people. And so we pay attention to what goes on over there because, you know, that's, that's, that's a really big deal based on Bible prophecy. So here in Matthew chapter 24, uh, Jesus, we're going to pick up, you know, partway into the conversation. Uh, and it says in verse 9, it says, Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You'll be hate, hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere. The love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Somebody say, that's me. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that the nations will hear it, and then the end will come. Uh, now, before I introduce my title, I want to tell you why I preach on messages like this. I preach messages like this because oftentimes what I have found is that it's not the big sins that get people off the path of following Christ. It's the silent killers that grab people like vice grips and shut them down little by little, slowly and quietly until it's too late. So I'm going to start a new series today called Vice Grips. Uh, Jesus says the closer we get to the end, believers are going to be arrested, persecuted, killed, and hated all over the world just for being a follower of Christ. Uh, in other words, what he's saying to us is that in the last days, being a Christian is going to cost you something. It might be your freedom. It might be your life. It might be your popularity. It might be your reputation. I don't know what it is, but when you decide to become a fully committed follower of Christ, it is going to cost you something. Now, it's hitting America 
a little bit later than many of the other nations of the world. If you look at the gospel just through the lens of America, then you will miss a lot of Bible prophecy because a lot of what you see unfolding, you may not see all of it here in America, but if you pay attention to what's going on globally, a lot of it is happening in other parts of the world. We're able freely to preach the gospel because of the, the freedoms that we have been given and that have been extended to us as Americans. But there are a lot of our brothers and sisters in Christ who risk their lives for their faith, who risk their lives to have Bibles come into their countries. While you and I can own as many Bibles as we like, and we may not even read you know, most of those Bibles that we have. But we have a lot of brothers and sisters who are persecuted for their faith in other parts of the world. Now, Jesus, uh, in, in this passage, lays out for us a progression. Uh, so you will see things will start off at one place and they will begin to progress and they will become more and more intense and frequent as time goes on. And he starts off by saying that uh, the closer we get to the end, people will, first of all, turn away from Jesus. And I'm, you know, when you turn away from the vertical relationship you have with God, what's going to happen as things progress is that it's going to affect your horizontal relationships that you have with other people. And the reason why we love other people uh, is because we love, first of all, God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, when people turn away from God, the next step is that people will begin to betray and hate other people. The next step after that is false prophets and deception will begin to fill the vacancies that people used to occupy who we loved and held dear and near and dear in our hearts. So you will find that whenever we experience betrayal or whenever hatred begins to settle in our heart towards other people, when we feel a certain way about somebody else, you'll find that most times when we deal with uh, some type of pressure in our relationship with others, it will take you back to your, the foundations of your faith to, to get you to, 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 to have you to answer the question if you really believe what you say you believe. Uh, I like to say it this way, that whenever you deal with pressure in your relationships with other people where you have to choose to forgive, where you have to choose to release a wrong that someone else has done to you, it will take you back to the foundational principles that make Christians Christians, like walking in love. Like, do you really believe the theology in the Bible when it comes to forgiveness? Do you really believe what it says about turning the other cheek, about not taking any account of a suffered wrong? The hardest times in my life as a Christian is when I have been betrayed. It's when I have felt I have been wronged by somebody else and I had to choose to do those verses that aren't popular. I had to choose to bless when I feel like I've been cursed. I choose to pray when I feel like I've been despitefully used. I had to choose to do the right thing regardless as to what somebody else did. Because how I many you know you doing what's right doesn't have anything to do with what somebody else does? I see you ain't going to get no amens over here on this side of the church. We say it again. So doing what's right does not have anything to do with what somebody else does. When you stand before God, you're not going to stand before God with five or six other people and God's going to pick the best one out the group. You will stand before God on your own. You will give an account on your own. You will be judged by yourself for the decisions that you made while you were here upon this earth. It doesn't matter if man is happy with who you are if God is not pleased with what's going on in your life. So false prophets and deception will fill vacancies. And when false prophets and deception rise up, sin will run rampant. Because bad teaching always precedes bad behaviors and lifestyles. False doctrine is what gives people permission to be able to engage in lasciviousness. So you got to understand, because of the way God made us with our conscience, if people don't get false doctrine and bad teaching, they'll never be okay with just saying yes to things that in their conscience they know are wrong. Now, the, the next thing that will happen is that love will begin to wax cold. Now, why is this a big deal? This is a big deal because Galatians 5 and 6 tells us that faith 
works by love. How many of y'all were at church last week? Raise your hand. I mean, you all remember last week we talked about that uh, faith without works is what? Dead. Is dead. And we defined the word dead last week. We said it's a corpse. So just like faith without works is dead, if you take away love, you take away faith. If you take away faith, you take away the shield. If you take away the shield, Satan is able to come in easily and just sift us like wheat. So you can't afford, I can't afford for the love in my heart to wax cold. Because if love wax cold, my faith won't work. If my faith won't work, I can't please God. If I can't please God, then I can't receive the things that he has for those of us that seek after him diligently. Now the good news is the Bible says he or she who endures to the end will be saved. This good news that the kingdom will be preached in all the world and then the end shall come. Well, let me ask you a question. Come on, let me ask you a question today. How many of y'all excited about Jesus coming back? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you're excited. You excited? Some people are like, no, nah, I ain't ready yet. If you're excited about Jesus coming back, then that means you need to be excited about getting this gospel preached in all the world. Because the only thing stopping that from happening is that the gospel's got to go all the way around the world and then he can actually return. So I don't know if we so much waiting on him or if he is really waiting on us to do our jobs. So now my big question for you is, will you be around in the end? See, he didn't say he who gets saved when they're six years old. He who knew the Lord at an early age. He who was baptized when they were a child. The Bible says he who endures until the end. We did a whole series over the last few weeks about the ten virgins and how five were wise and five were foolish. And how the five foolish couldn't get in because they they weren't prepared. They didn't have enough extra to to, to go the long haul. Here we find again the ones that are promised to be saved are those that endure until the end. Now, one of the things that we've been seeing these last few years, I'm not just talking about what's in the news right now. I'm I'm literally talking about the last several years. What has gotten my attention is we have seen uh, a lot of of pillars, uh, mothers and fathers in the faith who have gotten into scandals who have been in ministry for 30, 35, and 40 years. Man, when I see somebody that's in something for 30, 35, 40 years, most people that work in a profession for that long are ready to retire. They're ready for their mug, their, their, their watch, uh, their pin set, being celebrated at the office and then going home and figuring out what's next. Ministry is a different animal because you can work in ministry for 35, 40 years, be faithful, Uh, impact tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of lives. And the moment that a scandal comes up, everything that you have done up to that point gets erased. People don't care anymore what you did, how how many people were impacted, how much their life, they, they don't care. The moment a scandal happens, everything that you did before that is almost invalid up to that point. And I'm saying this because When you see these things happen amongst believers, whether they are a leader in the body or not, you should not look down your nose in disgust at someone else who fell into a vice or got into something that they should not have been in. Because my Bible tells me that if any brother be overtaken in a fault, let them that are spiritual restore them in a spirit of meekness taking a good hard look at yourself lest you end up falling into the same exact thing I'm looking at what's going on and thinking to myself my God that can happen to any of us and then what what is it what's going on what's happening and and I, my prayer today is that as we we get into our subject matter is that I'll be able to drag this vice out into the open and expose it for what it is because too many people underestimate the impact that this vice that we're going to talk about today can have on their life and that is the vice grip 
of offense. Offense. And listen, you ain't got to go far to see how easily offended people are today. Just driving traffic a little bit. A vice grip is a device with adjustable jaws used to hold an object firmly in place while work is being done on it. Vice grips are used to lock something in a set position. Now, offense is never the end goal for the enemy. It is just what the enemy uses to hold people in place while he slowly works on dismantling their beliefs, their convictions, their mindset, and their love for God and also for other people. We underestimate how patient Satan is. That he will get you offended in 2024 And wait 10 years to finish the job. And when offense comes in, that's not the end. That's just the beginning. Because he knows the only way he can win is I got to shut you down from the inside out before I can release my full attack upon your life. What has a hold on you? Look here in Acts chapter 24, verse 16. The Apostle Paul said, Therefore I always exercise and discipline myself, mortifying my body, deadening my carnal affections, bodily appetites, and worldly desires, endeavoring in all respects to have a clear, unshaken, and blameless conscience, void of offense towards God and towards men. Ask your neighbor on the side, when's the last time you worked out? <laughs> Woo! If they ain't say anything, they just kept looking forward and they already convicted today. Now, here's the thing is that when you're, you know, when you're young and you can, you can eat whatever you want, do whatever you, whatever you do and as often as you want to do it and the LBs just fall off, you just be like, can't touch this. Ah. You get older and all of a sudden, them hamburgers that you eat, them french fries that you eat like to hang around a little bit. Hang around your middle section. Hang around your back. Hang around your thighs. Like to hang around for a little while. You start to realize the older that you get, exercise is not optional. It's mandatory. The only thing I have to do to gain weight is just keep living. That's it. I just... It's not even an option anymore for me to go to the gym or not. I have to go to the gym. And see, Paul said, I have exercised and disciplined myself always. It's not something I do every now and then, you know, when my schedule frees up, when when I got an opportunity, you know, when, when I got a little bit of extra time. He said, I always exercise and discipline myself. And and let me speak to those of you that have been in the faith for a little while. Because sometimes seasoned believers think the people who need to exercise are new Christians. But I'm going to tell you the folks that really need to work out spiritually are those of us who have been around for some time. Because so oftentimes we think just because I can quote the verse, that means I'm doing it. Just because I know where it is in the Bible, just because I have it highlighted, just because I went through a few studies on it, that means I got it. And we get to a place as seasoned believers where we become spiritually fat, spiritually obese, like Eli. Eli lived off the fat of the offerings. He was taking things that did not belong to him. And because his physical condition was a type and a symbol of what was going on in the nation at that time, because he was taking things that didn't belong to him, he also, his eyesight was starting to go bad. 
And what happens as believers, man, when we don't exercise and discipline ourselves in the areas that we're supposed to, we'll start missing certain things that we used to be able to see clearly. Our discernment won't be what it used to be. We'll start to fall for things that we didn't fall for before because we let our guard down thinking because I got experience, I got this. And Paul said, no, I'm, I'm still disciplining myself, mortifying, putting my body to death, deadening its affections and its, and its appetites and its worldly desires. And then notice, he said, I do all this endeavoring to have a clear conscience that is void of offense before who? Before God and man. Not just God. God and man. Because I'm going to know you can be offended at God. Because of something that you thought was supposed to go a certain way, was supposed to work out, the way that you prayed, the way, you, the way that you decree and declare, the way that you knew what it was supposed to happen, and it didn't happen that way, you can get offended at God. I mean, you know, that's a fight you're just not going to win. Because he's not wrong. He's never wrong. He's never the one to blame. He's never the one that fell short. It, it's never like, ha ha, I got you, God. Y- yep, you said you're not a man that you should lie, but I caught you this one time in a lie. No, listen, if it didn't work out the way that it was supposed to work out, it's not because God is not faithful. Sometimes it's because man didn't do what they were supposed to do. And I'm not just talking about you. Sometimes there are other people involved in the, in the affairs of our lives. Sometimes somebody else's disobedience is what puts us in an inconvenient place, an unfavorable place sometimes. Sometimes it's the evil in someone else's heart that brings persecution and affliction and adversity into our lives. Sometimes it's the providence and sovereignty of God. You better thank God he didn't answer your prayer because had he answered your prayer, you think things are bad now, you would have hell on earth if the way you prayed and expected it to come to pass came to pass. There, we got to reach a point in our walk with God where we stop questioning his integrity just because something didn't work out the way that we expected. You can't follow somebody you don't trust. And some of you are having a hard time releasing certain things because you don't trust God because you're offended by something that happened. You got to forgive you got to forgive God just like you forgive other people. But you can't just forgive God. you got to forgive other people too. Uh, let's look at the next verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. All right. This is talking about love, the nature of love, what love is, what it looks like, how love operates, how it functions. Amen. Because, you know, everybody got a definition of love nowadays. Come on. You love me? You know I love you. How, how do I know you love me? Because you make me feel good. Mm. I love the way you make me feel, <laughs> baby. <laughs> Come on, that's what love is. Love today is you let me have my way. You let me do what I wanted to do. Ha, that's how I know you love me. And that's not agape love. That's not the love of God. God doesn't love you because he lets you get your way. I say I ain't going to get no amens on this side of the church today. <laughs> You know how you know God loves you? When he corrects you. (laughs) You wonder about whether or not you can get your way. My question is, do you feel the conviction of the Lord? Do you feel the chastening of the Lord? Because the Bible says those who God loves, he chastens. Love is not conceited, it's not arrogant, it's not inflated with pride, it's not rude, unmannerly. Love does not act unbecomingly. Love, God's love in us does not insist. Wait a minute, hold on, hold on now. This must be, this must be the archaic King James version of the Bible. Because this ain't the way we define love today. Love, if you love me, that means you let me do whatever I want to do. But here the Bible says love does not insist on its own right or its own way. For the, the God kind of love is not self-seeking. It's not touchy, it's not fretful, it's not resentful. It doesn't take any account of the evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. So you see, this is what love is, all right? Love by nature is not touchy. Come on, poke your neighbor a little bit. Poke him. Poke him. Come on, love is not touchy. Come on, if you're touchy, easily offended, easily angered, things easily get on your nerves... And watch this, you're working on your faith, but you really need to start working on your love. Because your faith works by this love. 
Notice love isn't fretful. Love, love is not, oh God, I don't know what I'm going to do. That's not the nature of love. Why? Because when have you ever prayed to God and God was freaking out about what was going on in the earth? God by nature is love and he is not fretful. God is so calm, he sets tables in the presence of his enemies. Ooh, come on. Love doesn't, God's kind of love doesn't take it account of the evil done to it, doesn't pay any attention to what suffered wrong. So you see, when we say things like, I will forgive, but I will never forget. That's not love. It's not the God kind of love. That might be your definition of love, but that's not the love God's talking about. Look here in St. John chapter 12. St. John chapter 12, we're going to find one of the times that Jesus was anointed. He was uh, anointed a few times. Uh, Matthew's account tells us he was at Simon the leper's house. Uh, Mark's account is the same. Luke's, Luke chapter 7 tells us he was at Simon the Pharisee's house. And here in John chapter 12, they're at Lazarus's house. So six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served. Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary, it's not, it's not his mother Mary. You know, there are a lot of Marys in the Bible. Uh, then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said the perfume is worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor because he was the thief, and since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. That's the first time I ever read that, that... Like, all them times I've read this story, like, he was not just stealing from Jesus. He was stealing the disciples' money, too. <laughs> Peter would have been mad, boy. He would have been cussing had he found out. Yeah. <laughs> Thomas would have been in doubt. I can't believe you've done this. <laughs> Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. So again, we're, we're going to dig into this a little bit more, talking about the vice grip of offense. So Mary's gift of generosity was offensive. Now, if you look at the other accounts, you look at Matthew's account, look at Mark's account, uh, look at Luke's account. Uh, John is, is, John's account is the one that points out Judas's response to what was happening. Now, you do have to understand this. Offense always speaks your language. Meaning that offense is always tailored to the things that will offend you. Offense knew Judas would be offended by this offering that was poured upon Jesus' feet. And for Jesus, it was in preparation for his burial. There was a purpose behind it. For Judas, this was just a waste of a year's salary. And, of course, he's saying this because he planned on take, you know, he had his, his eyes went big when he saw that alabaster box. He's thinking, I'm getting ready to sell this. Boy, I'm really, you know, about to increase my percentages. Not realizing this woman was going to pour it right there on Jesus' feet. Now, here's my question is that this was Mary's gift of generosity. What business was it of anybody else there to be offended by what this woman chose to do. She didn't raise another offering. She, this dinner was held in Jesus's honor. She didn't ask anybody to make an extra donation. They didn't ask them to sow a Genesis 46, 54 seed for the next, you know, 12 months. All she did was give a gift that came from her heart and was poured on Jesus's feet but yet other people in the room are offended. And, and listen to me, we can look at this and we can judge Judas because he was a thief, 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 thief. <laughs> but listen, I've been in ministry a long time. And I remember for a long time, Pastor E and I wouldn't even share our stories of the good things that happened with us because not everybody is happy for you. I'll fly under the radar. I won't say nothing about what God is doing in our lives, you know, because I, won't, I, I don't want to be tolerated. I'd rather be celebrated. And I mean, you know, there are many a times where someone has gotten blessed and people have been offended 
by what happened for somebody else. And the thing about it is that what does their blessing have to do with what's going on only inside of you? And this just goes to show, folks, we have got to start judging our offenses. Are we offended because what someone did was wrong? Or are we offended because someone else's words or actions expose something in us? See, whatever offends you reveals you. And anytime you are offended, you need to ask yourself these two questions. Is this a trap? Or is God revealing a limitation in me? Man, you don't hear anything else I say. Anytime you're offended, you need to ask yourself one of these two questions. Number one, is this a trap? I'm going to say, well, how do you know it's a trap? Well, if it looked like a trap, sound like a trap, smell like a trap, probably is a trap. You know, all of a sudden, you know, like for example, for example, if your spouse does something that you don't like and it offends you, and then the thought comes, they ain't no good. <laughs> well, listen to me. First of all, that's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not telling you that your spouse is no good. Come on, somebody. You have to judge your offense for what it is. It ain't a Holy Spirit. Now, it might be you. It certainly could be the devil. And because offense is a trap, you'll never be offended and then go to the next level. So identify, first of all, if it's a trap, if you feel like, okay, I'm offended now because the person that, uh, the person that I, I work under, that I serve with, uh, they challenge me in a way that's kind of hard for me. I don't like the way they say certain things. Uh, I don't like the way they deal with me. I feel like they're a little rough behind the edges. Well, do you get results? Absolutely. But I just don't like the way they present it. All right. So this is probably not a trap. What's happening is that God is revealing a limitation in you. See, offense is a ceiling and you will never elevate beyond your ceiling. So if you can't handle being talked to a certain way by people who are in leadership over you, then stop asking God for the hundredfold return. Because the hundredfold return comes with persecution. If everybody got to be super nice and flowery and, you know, put bows on it and, and ribbons and flowers and then present it, you're only going to be able to go so far. Because you're going to get in rooms where people are going to say things you don't like, do things that you don't like. And if you just get offended, you're trapped right there, mission aborted. And go right back to wherever you were before. A part of developing and advancing in the kingdom is to have tough skin but a soft heart. And listen, if you get offended easily, you ain't ready for promotion. Woo, boy, they don't like me here today. It's so funny. At the 8 o'clock service, I can always tell when people don't like sermons because they don't say hi to me at the end of the service. I'm serious. I've, I have observed this. Like, me and Siobhan were sitting out there, like, literally two or three people came out and said hi to me at the end of the 8 o'clock service. I was like, okay, this was a tough one. I said, just wait till the 10 o'clock. But listen, I love you. I love you, and I'm tired of seeing this silent killer grab a hold of believers' lives and begin to shut them down from the inside out. All right, let's go to, let's go to another story, John chapter 6. You still with me today? Look at your neighbor, see if they, just see if they're struggling, see if they're still with you. How your neighbor looking today? If they look sleepy, tell them that's not the Lord. That's not the Lord. That's not the Lord. Yep. How y'all doing online? How y'all doing online today? Y'all all right? Y'all all right? We can't hear you, but we, we just believe that we can. You, y'all all right today? All right. John chapter 6. Let's, let's dig into this a little bit more. Yes, I am the bread of life, verse 48, John chapter 6. As Jesus preached this sermon, hold on, let me give you some context here. Before we get into the details of this sermon, let's do this first. Don't read this like it's 2024. You need to read this like you just so happen to be visiting Jesus' church. 
Jesus is light-skinned just like me. And he's delivering, he's delivering a sermon, and he, he hasn't died yet. He hasn't been resurrected from the dead yet. He hasn't rolled out the brand new covenant yet. This is Jesus at the beginning of his ministry. Let's listen to the sermon. Here we go. <laughs> so I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate man in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I will offer to the world, may live, is my flesh. Then the people began arguing with each other about what he meant. How can this man give us his flesh to eat, they asked. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person at the last day. For my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. I live because of the living Father who sent me. In the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I'm the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, even though they ate the manna, but will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Many of the disciples said, <laughs> Now, Jesus, we love you. Okay? We'll follow you wherever you you leading us. But uh, we're not so sure how we feel about this sermon that you're delivering about eating your flesh and drinking your blood. Sounds a little cannibalistic. Not really sure how I feel about this. Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining and he said to them, does this offend you? Then what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven again? The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I've spoken to you are spirit and life. But some of you don't believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning which ones didn't believe, and he knew who would betray him. Then he said, that's why I said that people can't come to me unless the Father gives them to me. At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. And Jesus turned to the twelve and asked, are you also going to leave? Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom will we go? We, you have the words that that give eternal life. We believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. Now, wa now, now watch this now. Go back up, go back up to verse number uh, 61. So Jesus was aware when they listened to this sermon that his disciples were complaining and he asked the question, does this offend you? Notice what he didn't say. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I offended you. I, you know, I shouldn't have said that. That was a little extreme. Eating of my flesh, drinking of my blood. I'm going to go to sensitivity training. Because clearly as a new minister of the gospel, I haven't learned yet about things that I should say and things that I shouldn't. He knew that eating of his flesh and drinking of his blood was offensive to the people who were there. Now, here's the thing. He also didn't try to clear up what he meant. He could have easily said, when I say eat of my flesh, I'm talking about the bread later on that we receive during Passover. When I talk about drinking of my blood, I'm not talking about my actual blood. I'm actually talking about the wine that we receive when we take Holy Communion during the Passover. He could have cleared these things up. There were other things that offended uh, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and the people of Israel. Like they were offended by the fact that he claimed that he was the Messiah, yet Micah said the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem, but they was like, this dude is from Nazareth. He could have cleared it up. He could have said to them, actually, yeah, you know me as someone that's from Nazareth, but where I was born, I was really born in Bethlehem. But he never cleared that up. He never apologized for the offensive sermon. Matter of fact, he took it a step further. He said, if the sermon offends you, what are you going to do when you see the Son of Man ascend into heaven? In other words, you think this is offensive? This is level one. When you see the Son of Man ascend into heaven, he said that's more like level seven, level eight. 
But to get you ready for that, I first of all have got to say some things that are going to be hard for you to digest to determine whether or not you will still follow me. And the Lord knew there were many around him who claimed to be his disciples, but who really weren't his disciples. And all it took was an offensive sermon to get them to walk away. Watch this. If you can't handle sermons in church, how you going to handle being persecuted for Christ's sake? How you going how, how you going to handle your life all of a sudden being threatened because you you say that you're a Christ follower? How you going to make it during the, during the tribulation, if you can't eat or buy or sell goods unless you take the mark of the beast, how are you going to make it if you can't handle a sermon? I'm preaching better y'all saying amen in here today. If you get your feelings hurt and you get ruffled by level one offense, then don't, don't ask God to keep advancing you. Because the higher you go, the more opportunities you're going to have to get offended. Now, your neighbor, whatever offends you, reveals you. Now, notice there are levels to this in your relationship with God. There are levels to this. Jesus says to his disciples, right now, the level that we're on, I'm going to see how committed you are just through the sermon. Just the sermon. That's it. I'm going to test your commitment with the sermon. To see how you process it, how you take it. Many of the disciples walked away. The disi- Jesus turned to, his, to the 12, asked them, what are y'all going to do? Y'all going to leave too? They said, Master, where are we going to go? Where are we going to go? You're the one with the words of eternal life. See, now, they were in a different position than we're in today. Because, see, today, if you don't like it, you can go to the church down the street. Oh, I don't like this church. I don't like what they preach. I don't like all that stuff he be talking about. And watch this. Without praying, without being led by the Spirit, without acknowledging God at all, you can leave your place of destiny and go on a detour. And listen, the best that offense can offer you is plan B. It can take you on a detour, but it can't take you to your destiny. Abraham went on a detour to Egypt, even though God told him to stay in Canaan land. And listen to me, Satan will pay you to stay on the detour. Abram wasn't treated well for Sarah's sake. The enemy will put you on a detour, leading to a place that you were never supposed to be. In relationship with people you were never supposed to be in, and he will pay you well on your job. Give you increases on your job, increase your business to stay out there in plan B. Because you got offended by what it took to stay on the path leading to your destiny. You don't ever make major changes, major life changes in your life when there is offense living on the inside of your heart. Ever. 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 I said this earlier, the hardest years for me as a believer is when I felt like I was dealing with relationship pressure from those who I thought or believed loved me. Now, I don't need a whole lot of motivation to forgive. My motivation is Matthew chapter 20. If God doesn't forgive me, if I don't forgive other people, then God won't forgive me. (laughs) I don't need any more than that. that, I can't have my, my account overdrawn because I won't release What's going on in my heart? And, and here's the thing. Nobody else knows but you. You look good in church. Man. You, you know all, all the, 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 the Christian colloquialisms? You know, how, how you doing? Blessed, highly favored, and powered to prosper. But if we were to open you up on the inside and look in your heart, your heart is hard. You got unforgiveness in there. You're mad at people. And I don't know why, I don't know why we like pretending instead of just being real, being honest, acknowledging what's really going on, being true to ourselves. I just want to be true to me. Be true about what's, what you're carrying on the inside of that. Man. Woo. Revin is ministering today. 
It does not matter how offense comes. If given time, if left unchecked, offense can turn anyone into someone they never thought they would ever become. When your heart gets hard, you will shock yourself by some of the things you find yourself saying or doing. So what's your poison? What is the thing, if left unchecked, will poison your will? Racism? Politics? Donald Trump? <laughs> See, this is what we think. We think, well, I, don't, I can't hate everybody, but I can hate him. Okay. Okay, believe that. You're going to start shutting down on the inside. Joe Biden, women preachers, pro-Israel, white people. Slavery. Hmm? Men in general, ladies. Marriage, Just reminds you of what you never had. That's feminism, LGBTQIA-related issues. Police, purity culture, immigration. Come on, what's your poison? Abortion, social justice, submitting to authority. Anybody that says, God bless America? If this country enslaved us, I would never. Come on. What's your poison? And if I mention any of those things and your, your skin start to crawl, start to crawl you, you start to feel a certain way, you start adjusting in your seat, are you manifesting? Come on, Satan does not care what it takes in order to harden your heart from the inside. If you don't get the word on these matters and get past your offense, we will have more demonically oppressed Christians in the last days than we have ever had and they will enter your life through offense. They will grow stronger through your unchecked emotions and your carnal thoughts that you refuse to yield to God. They don't like me today, Rico. Preaching good? You're good. I appreciate you, sir. You gonna be at, you gonna be outside with me later on today? Appreciate it. See, I'm just a pastor that's bold enough to ask you the question. Because I'm I'm not just I'm not just caught up in church attendance. Somebody's got to ask you the hard questions. In Mark chapter 4, we'll close with this one, verse 16 and 17. Four different types of ground Jesus describes in the parable. We're just going to look at one. And in the same way, the one sown upon stony ground. Somebody say stony ground. <laughs> are those who, when they hear the word, at once receive, accept, and welcome it with joy. Verse 17. And they have no real root in themselves. So they endure for a little while. Then when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, they immediately are what? Amen. Offended, displeased, indignant, resentful. And they stumble and they fall away. Now, the stony ground person has the potential to become a good ground person because of how they receive the word. Notice when they get the word, they receive it immediately with joy. Their heart's in the right place. Man, if, if, they, if they stay in that good space, eventually they'll get to a place if they just hold on to it long enough, they'll produce 30, 60, and 100 times as much. But this tells us one of the reasons why we get offended. Because we don't have deep, deep, deep enough roots in the specific areas that we get offended in. 
If you get offended when you're around racism, it's because you don't have deep enough roots in the word in that area. If you get offended when you're around your spouse and they constantly riding you and getting on your nerves and et cetera, et cetera, that means you don't have deep enough roots in your heart when it comes to marriage. See, your offense is exposing your root system. You might can quote the word. You might know what the scripture says. But if when you hear it immediately, you are offended or you start trying to process the word through your situation, you're exposing your root system. See, as soon as we have problems or we're persecuted for believing God's word and we become offended, tripped up, enticed to sin, apostasy or displeasure. It is exposing the fact that the word we have received has not taken root on the inside of us. See, what's supposed to happen is when we deal with pressure externally, it's supposed to make us stronger internally. But when we don't hold on to the word because of the pressure we're feeling out here, then that means the seed has not been able to take root. And if the seed can't take root, the moment you find yourself in the storm, then when a persecution and, a, and trouble arises on account of the word, you're going to end up falling away. Amen? Amen. Appreciate y'all. I'll close with this one. Last one. Why is offense one of the enemy's weapons of choice? Proverbs 18, 19. A brother offended is harder to be won over than a strong city. And their contentions separate them like bars of a castle. This is what breaks my heart as a pastor. Is when I see believers offended and we can't get them back. They, they, they don't give themselves permission to bounce back. If they come back, they're never the same. It's like, man, you used to have like a joy in your heart. You used to be like fired up for the things of God. You back in church. But as soon as church is over, you out. Why? Because you forgave, but you didn't give yourself permission to go back to the person that you were before you became offended. Last thing we're going to do today is um, we have over here, we got one right here, and we also got another one outside on the porch. It's what we call our freedom boards. And uh, we want to encourage you today, there's some pins on the wall. If there are things that have offended you that you need to let go of, we're going to encourage you after we pray today to write it on the card, pin it on the board. And that be your way of saying, I am finished and done with this once and for all. Now, forgiveness is the first step most times. If you want your heart to change, whoever wronged you, you have to start praying for them. And I'm not saying like, Lord, I pray that lightning won't uh, <laughs> strike them from heaven, that they won't get a blowout on the freeway. <laughs> you, have to, you have to start asking God, what do you see in them that I don't see in them because of what's happened to me? And God will begin to give you his heart to pray for those individuals. What you're doing is rehabbing. You're rehabilitating your heart and getting it back to a place where it can take no account of a suffered wrong. Where it's not on edge whenever you're around that individual. And if you don't take those steps, you'll be like, man, I thought I forgave, but I guess I still feel a certain way. People don't struggle with forgiveness. They struggle with rehabilitation. They get injured, but they don't rehab. You have to rehab your injury. And the only way you can rehab your injury is you have to go back and do what you couldn't do after you were hurt. It's not just avoid it, pray it out of your life, never deal with it again. A lot of times you, you have to in some way revisit it in some way in order to get closure, to heal, and get your heart back to a place that it needs to be. Would you stand with me today? I mean, did I, did I talk to anybody today? One of, one of those. 
One of the poisons that was mentioned is like, oh, yeah, that was, that was me today. Yeah. Amen, Pastor. I'm going to ask that you lift your hands to heaven today. The Bible says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Say this with me. Say, Father, in Jesus' name. One of the greatest responsibilities you have given to us as Christians is to forgive. Say, I decide today that I will no longer harbor offense or unforgiveness in my heart towards those who have wronged me in times past. Me forgiving them has nothing to do so let me just make sure my team, are we good? Are we good? We'll just finish right now. Amen. <laughs> the timing of that is impeccable. All right. So let's, we'll, we'll keep our eyes open while we pray. How's about that? All right. So I say, Father, I release. I release the offense once and for all. Something has been revealed to me through this process. This process. Help, me God Help me, God, to remove the ceiling, to remove the, ceiling, to remove the, limitation, remove the limitation, and to grow, and to grow in, this in this area that I've struggled in in the past. I release, I release every person, every, person, every, entity, every entity, every organization, every organization or, business or business that I feel, that I feel has taken advantage of me in some way. I am not a victim. I am not a victim. Life is not just happening to me. You are sovereign. You are, you are providential. You are in control of my life. Anything coming against me will end up working for me. I believe it. I receive it. I declare that just like David prayed, my hands are clean. I'm purged with hyssop. My heart is renewed. And I'll never be the same. I refuse to be a bitter, broken believer. I'm healed. I'm restored. I am forgiven. Therefore, I forgive others. In Jesus' name. I'll go ahead and thank God. Thank you. thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, when you leave out today, like I said, you could take a, take a card, fill it out. Well, I don't want everybody knowing my business. You ain't got to put your name on it. Just, listen, the 8 o'clock service is showing you that there are some people that release some things today. The 12 o'clock service needs to see that it's some of you that release some things today during the service. So we encourage you to do that. If you need prayer, we will not just have ministers down front. We also have people outside with red shirts on that say need prayer. Maybe something that you're dealing with, you need a little bit of extra prayer. If that's the case, find someone in the parking lot on your way out today, and they'll be happy today to pray with you and to pray for you. If you're a first-time visitor today, we want to thank you so much for coming. If you didn't get a chance to stop by your guest experience tent on your way in, please make sure you stop by on your way out. we got some light refreshments, some snacks for you. Uh, some people there want to meet you, greet you, and answer any questions that you might have. Uh, lastly, um, that's it. All right. I love you today. God bless you. You are dismissed. Have a good week.